Today on the Pro-Life Podcast, the doctor is in. We're discussing synthetic wombs. Will they get FDA approval? Pros and cons. We're going to sort it out. Let's get started. Happy Thursday, Pro-Life family. Welcome to the table. Grab your coffee. This one's like my fourth. Okay. The doctor, the doctor is in today. We're happy to have him. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Thanks, thanks for being in, man. For the invite, you know, you guys just keep asking me to come back. And <laughs> I guess uh, we, we hopefully we'll find something good to talk about. I hope so. <laughs> well, today might be a little interesting. The FDA, FDA approval for synthetic wombs. Maybe. New company is seeking FDA approval. First, friends, if you'll introduce ourselves for the audio listeners. You got it. Kim Schwartz, Texas Right to Life Director of Media and Communication. I'm Dr. John Sego, President of Texas Right to Life. Brent Klingerman, IT guy and podcast front man. I don't know how I ended up in this chair. Hype, but hype man. Hype man. Yeah. yeah. Is that what is that the technical <laughs> term now? Is that what the kids are calling it? Mm-hmm. Hello, oh, children's. I too am young and hip. No, not at all. That's, not anymore. That's cutting Definitely for, not uh, anymore. Not anymore. Way too old for that. All right. So a company that makes artificial wombs is now seeking FDA approval for human trial? Right. Yeah. So there have been uh, trials that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia have been working on of developing a synthetic womb for the purpose of um, helping babies who are born very premature. This is a good goal, right? Like we all want to do that. That's what made me really psyched about this uh, topic of like, yeah, we encounter this question so much about what about children who have um, severe illnesses? What about times whenever the mom's health is in jeopardy by the pregnancy? Like, um, what can we do to help save that child? So this could be a really good development, but um, could also have some downsides that we might get into here in a bit. Uh, and so I think in the past, we've talked about synthetic wombs, more of like a theoretical, like eventually science might get here. Right. Sound a little sci-fi. Right. But actually this year, the FDA could consider whether to approve human trials for this synthetic womb. Um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has already been working on um, gestating premature lambs in this um, synthetic womb. So lambs who were born um, early on, they were able to um, develop these babies to term in the mm-hmm. synthetic womb, which is awesome. It sounds uh, like it could hold a lot of promises. What do you think? Yeah, no, this is an interesting topic because it's actually an example that I give um, when I'm speaking to college students about kind of being consistent with our pro-life views and the need, you know, like we actually need pro-life leaders right now studying, training, get, you know, kind of coming up in the ranks to help the pro-life movement take on these new questions. And, you know, we start whenever we have something like this, we always start at the foundation for us as pro-lifers is the dignity of the person, yes. the, the sanctity of human life. And then we build our views on whatever the topic is, if it's, you know, if it's uh, stem cell research or assisted suicide, whatever it is that we, we have to start with that foundation. And then we determine our view on this mm-hmm. issue. And some of them are straightforward, right? Uh, the sanctity of human life means we can't cause the death of another human being, whether they're sick or whether they're in the womb. Like we don't, we can't do that. That would be against the very first, you know, foundation of our views. But on this one, and in more issues that are gonna be coming up as we develop you know, more medical technology, is it's not as clear cut. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we start with the, mm-hmm. the integrity and the dignity of the human being, and then where do we go from there to get to something like an artificial womb or ecto gestation? Um, and so thinking about that, you know, is this gonna harm the mother? Is this gonna harm the child? You know, like you said, it has great potential to actually you know, help life, to actually help these tough cases where a child is premature. So in that sense, it, it looks good, but you know, we need to dive in a little bit deeper and see how could this be used for bad? You know, um, you know, how would we recommend its use? And then also just kind of being cautious about the development of this te- technology in general. Right, I mean, they say they're, they're asking for a trial phase, going to FDA trials which means human trials, we're going to have to try this out. 
we definitely, from an ethical standpoint, don't want to jump in like, well, being pregnant, I mean, you know, morning sickness sucks. I don't <laughs> want to do this. Sign me up for this other version. Like, we're talking medical emergencies, yeah. right? Yeah, so that's the danger is that it becomes a convenience rather than a therapy. So therapeutic use is, yes, we have this medical circumstances where, uh, you know, the, the mother's uh, water breaks early in pregnancy. Right. And she, you know, th that the child has to be delivered. Uh, she's going to have an infection. It's not good for the child. Like there, there's yeah. going to be serious issues if we don't deliver the child. So then the child is very premature. That would be a great circumstance where maybe this intervention could help. Um, and so, yes, it, it, that would be a therapy. We had a medical emergency We're we're actually helping. But as you said, it could easily become just a convenience. Okay, well, yeah. <clears throat> later pregnancies are very trying, very difficult for women. And so let's just, you know, make it normal to use this machine rather than <laughs> biological. Like in some cases we hear movie stars who are like, well, you know, going all the way to 40 weeks might really wreck my body. I'm just going to go ahead and get a C-section a little bit early and mm -hmm. get this done. Where normally we would consider a C-section as something you do when medically necessary, right. not, yeah. just well, you know, this will be more convenient. It'll fit my schedule better. And, it's like, and yeah. But we've seen Hollywood people do that. Well, we've also seen a trend of surrogacy mm -hmm. of that too. using, you know, uh, someone wants a child. And so they ask another woman to carry their child. And that, you know, the same kind of thing is like mm -hmm. that is, is for convenience. Uh, it, it, it's got a whole lot of problems. We don't have to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a whole lot of problems on mm -hmm. that one. But yes, this idea of what was once for this technology we're talking about of having a artificial womb, a machine that helps grow the child and develop the child before birth um, instead of staying with their mother, you know, this machine could be uh, very good for medical treatment in the extreme cases, uh, but not a good tool mm -hmm. to have just on hand if we feel like it. Okay. So in these medical cases right now, say we've got a child who's in that, you know, viability D differs depending on medical resources available in your area. But say we're in that kind of 25 week gray area mm -hmm. where some places you've got more options, other places you don't. Would this be a better option than maybe some of the other technologies available? Yeah, I mean, there are some like crazy stories that have come out of very premature babies uh, actually surviving. And my favorite story, which is like just insane, was from this last year, there was a baby born in Wales and it was the tiniest baby ever in Wales. Um, she was 11 ounces, born at 23 weeks. Okay. And what the hospital did um, to... Uh, That's crazy. Oh, You're right. okay. I'm I just, thought you were like, I'm, no. It was I'm like, just thinking that about is, 11 that is, ounces. Yeah. That is less than a soda can. Oh my gosh. Well, when you say it like that, geez. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, so... Um, this baby born 11 ounces, 23 weeks, and what the hospital did what, to um, try to like save her life was um, they needed to keep her organs warm. So they used a sandwich bag. They put her body in a sandwich bag, not her head, her body, um, to, <laughs> to uh, help keep her organs warm. And it actually like that's what saved her life. And mm. so she developed, she spent I don't know how many days in the NICU, and now she's home with her family. Oh, wow. And it's incredible to see, like, whenever we have this commitment to life, that uh, miracles like this happen because mm. we see that we are prioritizing the patient, that we're operating from this value that this person is worth all of our efforts. This person mm. is worth um, everything that we can do to try to save her life. And so you see awesome mm -hmm. stories like that. You see babies born. I think the youngest baby ever born was at and survived was at 19 weeks. Yeah. And that's incredible. So maybe we can push that viability line back and back and back. And that's important because viability often comes up in the discussion of abortion mm. that, um, you know, the, even in our court records, it said like, well, the child's not really alive. The child doesn't have a right to life until they can survive outside the mother's womb. Right. And that's a really dumb idea, um, just for so many reasons. Um, <laughs> yes. One of them is that... Uh, 
that means that the child's dignity is not something inherent within themselves. The child's dignity depends on what we have available to take care of him or her. Mm. And I think we can't, we shouldn't apply an external value like that to any person. If anyone has value, it comes um, from the, the value that the Lord has instilled within us. It's not dependent on our external circumstances. And so hopefully with this technology, you know, we can still push that line further back and back and get people to see actually, yes, your, your life has been valuable from the very beginning, not mm -hmm. just at the point where we're able to take care of you. Yeah. No, I think like that principle that you just talked about is really critical for pro-lifers to catch and to hang on to because this is the idea that is really important in the assisted suicide debate as well mm -hmm. is this idea that for us to advance as a society, to have better medicine, better technology, we have to start with a commitment to the person. And in the assisted suicide debate, unfortunately, it starts with an abandonment of the patient. It so it says, okay, you ha have this certain cancer, we don't have a cure for it. We don't, we can't address, you know, this disease that you have. Instead of trying, instead of developing and innovating and trying and experimenting and trying new things to help you and other patients, we're just going to give up. We're right. not gonna try. And so I think this is important for us is like the pro-life movement, we should be the biggest cheerleaders and the biggest engine for medical advancement, for medical technologies to address. I mean, there are pain, you know, right now, pain science is a really big issue of trying to address how do we, uh, how do we, help patients who are experiencing different types of pain and levels of pain that we don't know what to do with. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's not in the body. It's it's very it's cognitive and it's, you know, really hard problem, hard questions. Um, and instead of saying, okay, well let's just find all the patients that have this disease and offer them assisted suicide, right. like we should be the biggest cheerleaders of let's figure this out. Like pro-lifers should go into those fields, commit their lives to serving these vulnerable patients. And so I think you're absolutely right, is like with these premature babies, let's find better ways to treat them. The word of caution I do have though, is that uh, it's great to push on technology and, and to be you know for medical advancement, but we do have to like, be careful as as Christians and as pro-lifers of the hubris that usually is right there with it of we can create a womb that is, you know, basically does what God designed. That we can do exactly what he did. And so you have, you know, a natural process that is amazing, uh, that is phenomenal. And we're learning new things about it. I mean, every year yep. about, um, you know, the development of children, what the, how the mother's actually caring for the child in womb. Like we're learning crazy, amazing things. Uh, and so then for some scientists to come along and say, okay, yeah, I can do that. Easy. Yeah, easy. Don't worry we about make, it. <laughs> we can make an artificial womb. Um, that that's a should be a, a red flag for us as Christians. Yeah, Definitely. I think, and we can pick up on some more of those red flags and more of this discussion after the break. Great news. Texas Right to Life is celebrating our 50th birthday this year. This is half a century of victories that the Lord has given us, but God is not done yet. The battle for life is only increasing as the abortion industry is going underground to promote death and sell abortion. Join us in supporting Texas Right to Life's 50th birthday campaign and chip in with a gift today. Thank you for 50 years of saving lives. And friend, the best is yet to come. Get your tickets today for the convention for life. This is honestly, this is like my favorite convention all year. June 22nd in Houston at Grace Church in the Woodlands. We're gonna level up that pro-life knowledge and you are gonna be a pro-life expert. We're gonna hear from an amazing lineup of speakers to help you defend your beliefs, including author Danielle D'Souza Gill. If that D'Souza name sounds a little familiar, yeah, Dinesh's daughter. It's gonna be an amazing time. We are gonna celebrate the anniversary of the overturn of Roe v. Wade, and we're gonna look forward and talk about some of the issues facing our movement. Get your tickets at conventionforlife.com. All the details and links below, conventionforlife.com. We'll see you in June. Welcome back, friends. You can still get your tickets, Convention for Life. We wanna see you there in June. I'll be there. John's gonna be there. I'll be there. 
It's going to be an awesome time. Shoot, I'll even be there. <laughs> yeah, <awesome>. Man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we bullied you into it, peer pressure? Yeah. Hey, if you want to use the code PODCAST, you'll get 20... Mm, let's make let's make it 25. Let's go crazy. Ooh. Make it 25% off your purchase. So we'll see you in June. It's a fire sale. Wow. It's, it's not a fire sale yet. <laughs> wow, come oh, on. Man. This is, we, are, we are still... Like, we've just announced this is happening. Yeah, so. that's oh, true. Okay. We're just really early in the ticket purchasing. Okay, so. good, good. Yeah, yeah. Lots it's of still, room, get your ticket now. It's still just a fire, fire sale. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Okay, we're, we're discussing some of the red flags with this new tech. Yeah. 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 And like, so we were saying that it, as great as it is as a like emergency situation, you know, if you have a mom who's going into labor early, they have to deliver this child. Like this is a good option to help the child, um, if it works out to help the child uh, develop uh, normally whenever if he or she can't be in her mother's womb. Um, but we're not at the situation yet where you can use this just at any stage in pregnancy. So far, yeah. they've only successfully tested it with lambs who have like gestated in their mother's wombs as long as they could and then um, delivered early and had to finish gestation in the artificial womb and it worked out. Mm -hmm. They haven't been able to take like an embryo from the very beginning and <clears throat> gestate from like 40 weeks along in the synthetic womb. We're not yeah. there yet. I think we all can see that's where this will probably go and yeah. there are some problems with that. And especially because like, we don't know all the like beautiful symphony that occurs between the mother and the child in the womb during pregnancy. Like we mm -hmm. get glimpses of it through science, but there's no way to know like all the things that the Lord had made work in harmony. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's just natural to us. It just happens. Well, yeah. That like biblical imagery of God weaving together, you know, the, the child's body uh, in the womb, like intricately made, like that, you know, yeah, it is a, it's a, I like the idea, it's like a symphony. It's like a very intricate, beautiful process. And uh, it, it's kind of laughable for us to think we, we get it. We right. Can, we can just like make a replica of that. Don't worry, God, I got this. Yeah, Don't yeah, even yeah, yeah. worry. You can take a break on this one. Not, yeah. Nope. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I think there's a lot going on that we don't know about. I mean, the sheep that have been born through this process and they make it to adulthood aren't super talkative about their experience. <laughs> so there, there could be some long-term effects we yeah. don't know about, won't know about for yeah. some time. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, whenever we, I, I love to see studies in each year, you know, there's some studies that stand out to us as we uh, see about kind of learning more about what's actually going on in uh, embryology and in, in the child mm -hmm. development in the womb. And one of the ones like last year that really blew me away was about speech patterns of children. And so what children are in the womb, they are learning how to talk. They are learning how to communicate. And the speech patterns of the mother get, you know, kind of are, are handed off to the child, you know, unconsciously uh, in the womb. And they're learning about even how the mother talks to someone. And the study that I was looking at was tracking um, like accents, like regional accents. Really? And how it had an effect on the child. And so a mother who has, you know, a strong draw or a strong accent, um, that is actually passed on to the child, even if the mother moves from that region. So the child is not hearing everybody talk this way. Um, mm -hmm. They're not hearing their mother talk that way for very long. The mother, so the mother has this accent and then they're in, she's in a second location where they don't have this accent. The child is born, grows up, and is emulating the mother's accent. Oh my now gosh. Now you would think like, well, the child is also hearing their siblings and hearing, you know, they're hearing the dad and you're hearing the friends. And like everybody. So they're knowing them. But it shows that these, these correlations, and it's things about hmm. the speed of their speech, the cadence of their speech, the tone, and things that match their mother. So in the womb, you know, there are things going on that we're barely scratching the surface, you know, chemically, um, you know, auditorily and developmentally that 
So to say we can build a machine that will do all of that, like we don't even know what features the machine needs to have. Yeah. Like, you know, the the speech pattern you right. know, feature. We didn't right. build that in because we didn't know it was actually a thing. Can I have Morgan on. Freeman do that for <laughs> <laughs> Just like, see what happens. Just well, constant that's, nine that's months the thing. of Can James you, Earl like, Jones all audio these Bible. questions. It comes really experimental. It's like we could really mess up a kid. <laughs> we, you we could, you we could. could. Yeah. They would not be. You know, I, I don't just know. Just James Earl Jones audiobooks, and they all come out oh like talk gosh. like Darth Vader afterwards. Genius. I mean, or Mufasa. Either or, one. Let's go with Mufasa. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, or you just really mess up the kid. <laughs> so I don't. Also know. possible. But there's also things about like the heartbeat. Like in the womb, mm. it's very loud. Like you, she, it, like yes. the, they hear the heartbeat, and of their mother, and that is like a very important thing, like a uh, sense of time mm -hmm. is like a very important thing for, for the child as well. So there's a lot going on um, that, you know, to, to make it a convenience that, oh, you know, it would just, the same outcome, you know, emergency situation, absolutely, this is good because it is, you know, it's right. an emergency it's situation. Right. It's, yeah. it's like either the child will die because we don't have any other technology to take care of her or, you know, we use this uh, synthetic womb. So it's like, okay, good. This is a good, like, last ditch effort sort of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we just, as pro-lifers, we'll just have to be prepared for when it is trying to be used in a commercial setting. When it is, if it, if it gets there, then it will be trying to use as an alternative to creation order. And so I think that's one thing that we have to we'll have to be prepared for is to to be that you know voice that concern. Um, the other thing that this does have the potential if we get there is seeing children as commodities, mm. and that's a huge thing. And and there's this is not just on this one piece of technology, right? right. This is this is a big thing. We talked about like in surrogacy, um, even in adoption, you can have this view of children as an object to be acquired and a very selfish kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whereas from the Christian perspective, children are a blessing from the Lord. Children are always to be received as blessings from the Lord, even in difficult circumstances, yeah. in the hardest cases when, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have a child, it was not an accident. The Lord is not surprised, right? That, that there's a child in the situation. Um, and so when we get into this, kind of technology though, it could become uh, like, well, yeah, it could become seeing the child as an object to make you happy. And it could be something like more commercial, you know, commodity to be, um, to be purchased and, you know, uh, customized, right? right? You know, like we see with, with IVF and, and <sighs> IVF of, and CRISPR and yeah, all the other it, weird, it, yeah. Some of these other trends. And so we just have to be careful because anything that gets us further away from creation order, mm -hmm. um, the way that God designed it, the way that God uh, made women and their capacity to have children, every step we take away from that order, that natural situation with a man and a woman having a child, we should be more and more concerned and we should be you know, kind of more and more critical. And so that's, we talked about surrogacy, that is one step away. Now we're talking about you know, technologies of creating embryos in the laboratory. Well, that's very far away from- Embryos in the lab with three people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the then three parent embryos. On top of that. And, and then now we're moving away to not just creating life in the lab, but also growing life in the lab. And so I think, you know, as, as Christians, you know, the alarm bells get louder and louder the further we get away from that. And so we do have to be careful. We do have to be cautious um, about that. But as far as just, a medical intervention in in you know difficult circumstances where life is really in jeopardy. I think you're absolutely right. This is a very promising and interesting topic, um, and I hope that they're successful. Um, you know, it's definitely something that pro-lifers need to keep an eye on. Yeah. So this year, the FDA could approve human trials for um, this technology. That's what the um, researchers are asking for: is human trials. Are there any concerns that we should have about, um, you know, testing this on humans? The the idea of human experimentation <laughs> is is one that has a long history for Christians. Um, back in the the fifties and the early sixties, this is what brought Christians to uh, a lot of bioethics debates: ah. is experimentation on humans 
and what are the limits? You know, you have to get consent. You can't, then there's all these bioethical scandals of times when a population was treated as guinea pigs and uh, Christians, you know, Christian uh, moral, uh, moral theologians were the ones saying, hey, like that is disrespectful to the human person. Um, that's, that is not acknowledging their dignity when you're treating them as, you know, an, a means to an end, you know, mm-hmm. developing some treatment for another group of people. So that's where Christians kind of jumped into these types of debates. And so absolutely, we should be cautious about turning our children into, um, you know, products of experimentation for the benefit of, of people, you know, who, who aren't here yet. And so we need to be really careful with, with that and make sure that we are not doing it electively. You mm-hmm. know, it's not something you can sign up for. Okay, well, I have a, you know, uh, this healthy mom wants to volunteer and right. you know, wants to, for her child to be, you know, exper- you know, kind of be participating in this experiment. So, uh, you know, I would be surprised if we went down that route okay. just because of the history um, of of bioethics and, and around human subject uh, trials. So, but it is something we have to be careful of. Of yes. yes, this is possibly a good thing, but we can never use, you know, people even yeah. if they're premature babies. Mm-hmm. We can never use them as <sighs> instruments for our own good. Yeah, true. All right. You know, that's it's a very important reminder why we have to stay at the table of these conversations as as our culture moves more and more post-Christian and, you know, the church has kind of lost some of its seat at the table of culture, we still have to make sure that we're engaging in these conversations. So friends, here's your conversation topics, right? You can talk to your friends and neighbors about, it's. I know it's weird and it's kind of sci-fi, but hey, it's in the movies, right? We're, mm. we're seeing these kinds of things <laughs> in pop culture where it's like, oh, it's normal. The upload is a thing and all, all these other weird things. So, you know, you can always use that as a starting point in conversation mm-hmm. to transition into, well, the real world is actually trying these things. And here's, here's the here's benefits of the tech and here's some concerns. Yeah. It's where humanity has a history of doing something real dumb. Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom in the like yuck factor, like the weird, like it feels <laughs> weird. It seems odd. Like that moral mm. instinct, like that's mm-hmm. your conscience. Like yeah. that, is, <laughs> that is what you were built with. What? <laughs> and so like, yeah, so maybe the conversation yep. with your friends starts like, what? That sounds way too weird. That creeps me out. Right. That's a good thing. That is, yeah, and that's, that's kind good. of a sign. Like maybe we should talk about. Right. This. Right. Yeah. So synthetic wombs can be your party trick now. So. <laughs> oh no. Ecto gestation is the fancy, the fancy term <sighs> okay. if you want to impress your friends. Ecto gestation. Yeah, it sounds like Ghostbusters. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Kind of does. All right. Well, maybe we're not going to bust any ghosts, but. You know, some bad, bad ethical ideas. We can can bust some of those. Well, friends, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share, have some of these kind of odd conversations with your friends. And maybe you can teach them about ecto gestation. You learned a new word today. So thanks for watching. We will see you next time.